they are always represented as living just before the Trojan War, at the same time as Theseus and Jason and Atalanta. They took part in the Calydonian boar hunt. They went on the quest of the Golden Fleece. They rescued Helen when Theseus carried her off, but in all the stories, they play an unimportant part, except in the account of Castor's death, when Pollux proved his brotherly devotion. The two went. We are not told why, to the land of some cattle owners, Idas and Lynchius. There, Pindar says. Adas made angry in some way about his oxen, stabbed and killed Castor. Other writers say the cause of the dispute was the two daughters of the king of the country. Leucippus Pollux stabbed Lynceus and Zeus struck Idas with a thunderbolt, but Castor was dead, and Pollux was inconsolable. He prayed to die also. You should really pray to die in your best spiritual state. And Zeus, in pity, allowed him to share his life with his brother to live. Half of thy time beneath the earth, and half within the golden homes of heaven. According to this version, the two were never separated again. One day, they dwelt in Hades, the next in Olympus, always together. The late Greek writer, Lucian, gives another version in which their dwelling places are heaven and earth. And when Pollux goes to one, Castor goes to the other, so that they are never with each other. In Lucian's little satire, Apollo asks Hermes, I say, why do we never see Castor and Pollux at the same time? <clears throat> What are the constellations? Um, well, Hermes replies, They are so fond of each other that when fate decreed one of them must die and only one be immortal, they decided to share immortality between them. Not very wise, Hermes. What proper employment can they engage in that way? I foretell the future. Asculapius cures diseases. You are a good messenger, but these two, are they to idle away their whole time? No, surely. They are in Poseidon's service. Their business is to save any ship in distress. Ah, now you say something. I'm delighted. They're in such a good business. Two stars were supposed to be theirs. The Gemini, the twins. They were always represented as riding splendid snow-white horses, but Homer distinguishes Castor above Pollux for horsemanship. He calls the two Castor, tamer of horses, Polyusus, good as a boxer. The Sileni were creatures, part man and part horse. They walked on two legs, not four, and they often had horses' hooves instead of feet, sometimes horses' ears, and always horses' tails. There are no stories about them, but they are often seen on Greek vases. The satires, like Pan, were goatmen, and like him, they had their home in the wild places of the earth. 
in contrast to these unhuman, ugly entities. The female entities of the woodland are all lovely maiden forms, the Oreads, nymphs of the mountains, and Dryads, sometimes called Hamadryads, nymphs of the trees, whose life was in each case bound up with that of her tree. Aolus, king of the winds, also lived on the earth. An island, Aalia, was his home. Accurately, he was the only regent of the winds, viceroy of the entities considered to be gods. The four chief winds were Boreas, the north wind, in Latin Aquilo, Zephyr, the west wind, which had a second Latin name, Favonius, Natus, the south wind, also called in Latin, Oster, and the east wind, Eurus, the same in both Greek and Latin. There were some beings, neither human nor divine, who had their home on earth. Prominent among them were the centaurs. They were half men, half horse, for the most part. They were savage creatures, more like beasts than men. One of them, however, Chiron, was known everywhere for his goodness and his wisdom. The Gorgons were also earth dwellers. There were three and two of them were immortal. They were <clears throat> they were dragon like creatures with wings, whose look turned men to stone. Fork ice, son of the sea, and the earth was their father. The gra -i -a were their sisters, three gray women who had but one eye between them. They lived on the farther bank of ocean. The sirens lived on an island in the sea. They had enchanting voices, and their singing lured sailors to their death. It is not known what they look like, for no one who saw them ever returned. Very important, but assigned to no abode, whether in heaven or on earth, or the fates. Mo-ir-a in Greek, parka in Latin, who Hesiod says, give to men at birth evil and good to have. They were three, Clotho, the spinner, who spun the thread of life, Akesis, the disposer of lots, who assigned to each man his destiny, Atropis, she who could not be turned, she who carried the abhorred shears and cut the thread at death. Wrong point of time right here. Um, and the good and evil assigned at death, uh, I mean, you know, at birth, basically, your opportunities towards one or the other. And obviously, you know, what other people can choose or to do or not do for you. So, um, the Roman gods, the 12 great Olympians mentioned, Earlier were turned into Roman gods, also. The influence of Greek art and literature became so powerful in Rome that ancient Roman deities were changed to resemble 
the corresponding Greek entities, and were considered to be the same. Most of them, however, in Rome, had Roman names. These were Jupiter, or Zeus, Juno was Hera, Neptune was Poseidon, Vesta was Hestia, Mars was Ares, Minerva was Athena, Venus was Aphrodite, Mercury was Hermes, Diana was Artemis, Vulcan or Mulciper was Hephaestus, Sarah was Demeter. Two kept their Greek names, Apollo and Pluto, but the latter was never called Hades, as was usual in Greece. Bacchus, never Dionysus, was the name of the wine entity, who had also a Latin name, Liber. It was a simple matter to adopt the Greek entities because the Romans did not have definitely personified entities of their own. They were a people of deep religious feeling, but they had little imagination. They could have never created the Olympians, each a distinct, vivid personality. What they considered to be their gods, before they took over from the Greeks, were vague, hardly more than a those that are above. Well, more implied power, right? They were the Numia, which means the powers are the wills, the will powers, perhaps. Until Greek literature and art entered Italy, the Romans felt the Romans felt no need for beautiful poetic gods. They were a practical people, and they did not care about violet tressed muses who inspire song, or lyric Apollo making sweet melodies upon his golden lyre, or anything of that sort. They wanted useful entities, an important power, for example, was one who guards the cradle. Another was one who presides over children's food. No stories were ever told about the Numia. For the most part, they were not even distinguished as male and or female. The simple acts of everyday life, however, were closely connected with them and gained dignity from them, as was not the case with any other Greek entities except Demeter and Dionysus. The most prominent and revered of them all were Laris and Penitus. Every Roman family had a Lar. It was the spirit of an ancestor in several Penites, considered to be gods of the hearth and guardians of the storehouse. They were the family's own entities belonging only to it, really the most important part of it the protectors and defenders of the entire household. They were never worshipped in temples, but only in the home, where some of the food at each meal was offered to them. There were also public layers and, penit and penates, who did for that city what the others did for the family. There were also many Numina, connected with the life of the household, such as Terminus, guardian of the boundaries, Priapus, cause of fertility, Pallas, strengthener of cattle, Salvanus, helper of plowmen and woodcutters. A long list could be made. Everything important to the farm was under the care of a beneficent power, never conceived of as having a definite shape. Saturn was originally one of the Numia, the protector of the sowers and the seed, as his wife, Ops, was a harvest helper. In latter days, he was said to be the same as the Greek Cronus, and the father of Jupiter, the Roman Zeus. In this way, he became a personality, and a number of stories were told about him. In memory of the Golden Age, when he reigned in Italy, the great feast of Saturnalia was held.
every year during the winter. The idea of it was that the Golden Age returned to the earth during the days it lasted. No war could then be declared, slaves and masters were at the same table, executions were postponed, it was a season for giving presents, it kept alive in men's minds the idea of the quality of a time when all were on the same level. Janus, too, was originally one of the Numia, an entity of good beginnings, which we are sure to result in good endings, he became personified to a certain degree. His chief temple in Rome ran east and west, where the day begins and ends. He had two doors between which stood a statue with two faces, one young and one old. The doors were closed only when Rome was at peace. In the first 700 years of the city's life, they were closed three times in the reign of the good king Numa. After the first Punic War, when Carthage was defeated in 241 BCE, and in the reign of Augustus, when Milton says, no war or battle sound was heard the world around. Naturally, his month, January, began the new year. Thalmus was Saturn's grandson. He was a sort of Roman Pan, a rustic entity. He was a prophet, too, and spoke to men in their dreams. What if a lot of these were really people at some point and like certain groups, you know, they sort of became in people's eyes what, you know, what they later considered them to be. The founds were Roman satires. Quirinus was the name of the deified Amulus, the founder of Rome. The Manus were the spirits of the good dead in Hades. Sometimes they were regarded as divine and worshipped. The Lemurus or Larva were the Lemurs, um, the Lemurs, um, <clears throat> it right the last time, um, were the spirits of the wicked dead and were greatly feared. The Kemena began as useful and practical female entities who cared for springs and wells and cured diseases and foretold the future. But when the Greek entities came to Rome, the Kemena were identified with those impractical entities like the Muses who cared only for art and science. Agaria, who taught King Numa, was said to be a Kamena. Lucina was sometimes regarded as a Roman Isle Ith Ia Ia. <clears throat> Isle Ith Ia. The female entity of childbirth but usually the name is used as an epithet for both Juno and Diana. Pamana and Bertumnus began as num numina, as powers protecting orchids and gardens, but they were personified later, and the story was told about how they fell in love with each other. Now, if you don't just have one version of the myth, like, you know, picking up a Bible, you end up realizing that the personifications and dividing into different gods and all that sort of stuff uh, seems to come later, right? Maybe issues that the people themselves have changed that.